background on who I am. So my name is Michelle Cote. I'm the Director of Business Development for Detson Industries. Um, my background is kind of interesting. I started uh, working for a builder in 2006 and uh, shortly after that, so I was managing um, the marketing and sales team. Shortly after that, I went to the service organization that brought Energy Star for New Homes into Canada. And uh, so I worked with builders, utilities, uh, manufacturers across Ontario um, for about five years. And then I decided I was kind of bored of that. So I went to a utility. I went to gas, um, Enbridge Gas Distribution and uh, diversified a little bit more into commercial construction. So ICI selling energy efficiency incentives for new construction um, for commercial guys and uh, doing um, uh, design charrettes to get commercial um, engineers to adopt energy efficiency into new buildings. And then I met these Canadian guys. Um, and back to back up even further, in 2008, 2009, so the leading edge Energy Start for New Homes builders, the R2000 builders of, of the world, we're having a really hard time finding furnaces that were low enough BTU. So the gas utilities were getting to a point where they're like, okay, we're, we're going to start losing business to electricity. We need to find a low BTU gas um, forced air system. So at that time, I was calling around, um, hey, we've got this opportunity to start working with us. And, and uh, so when I left uh, Enercoli, that was the bee in my bonnet. And I went to commercial construction at the utility and um, I got a phone call and, and my colleague had met this Canadian manufacturer. They have these really small BTU furnaces, you got to check these out. And so I met these guys and, and I loved fundamentally what they were doing to fix the problems that we we're having as an industry and I jumped ship. So I've been at Detson for two years. So I work with builders, utilities, if you think of the extension of a builder team, uh, certified energy evaluators, HVAC designers, utilities, you name it, that's who I work with across Canada and the U.S. So that's a little bit about me. Um, can you help identify for me who's in the room? So, uh, contractors. Perfect. Of the contractors in here who's installed a Detson system? Great. Okay, awesome. Uh, HVAC designers? Awesome. Engineers? Consulting? Anyone I'm missing? Other manufacturers? Sure. All right. So um, let's talk about how we got here and what we did to understand how we got here. Uh, we'll, I'll walk you through that. So we know that we as an industry in, in new construction are on a path of continual improvement. And as Kim's talking about, we, we're trying to get there as well on the on the retrofit existing housing um, market as well. So we've got increasing energy efficiency in codes, continual movement on there. Um, we've got high performance home programs, R2000, LEED, Passive House, um, things like that that are influencing. Comfort and customer expectations are on the rise and the increase. So the more that we talk about energy efficiency and the benefits of energy efficiency, we all say, oh, your house is healthier, it's quieter, everything else. So the customer expectations are getting higher and higher and higher. I'll give you a really good example. I did a solar project in Peru. These people have never had electricity in their houses. They're burning diesel fuel, right, to have light. Um, their literacy rates are pathetic because they don't have light to read. Um, <coughs> so we change their lives. So we go in put a 25 watt solar panel, four LED light bulbs. We hook them up with electricity. We're all in the house, they, they turn on the light for the first time, they're like, when can we get a refrigerator? <laughs> right? So <laughs> same thing with um, energy efficiency and comfort. So you said my house was gonna be airtight. Why can I feel a draft, right? So it, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, our expectations are getting higher and higher. And noise has continually come into that equation defining comfort, right? And then you've got, never mind the difference between what a 
um, a woman says is comfortable versus what a man says is comfortable, right? <laughs> right? So you've got all those different expectations as well. Then square footage is more of a premium, so land is more expensive, so of course our prices are going up in new construction as well. And so we don't have that, that same space for mechanical um, room. Um, and visually when you're selling um, a 1,100 square foot townhouse for a family, bulkheads start really adding up to make someone feel like I have, I have no space. Um, then we don't want complicated. We've had builders tell us our system looks like a spaceship. The homeowners are intimidated. They just want a regular system. Don't do complicated. And we all know that um, innovation is expensive or sounds expensive, right? That's the first thing. Oh, is it innovative? Uh, forget it. And on top of that, builders like tried and true technology. They don't want to be the guinea pig. They, they just want to know it's going to work and not screw around. So, number of different factors that we heard as a manufacturer <coughs> when we started engaging builders. I'll back up again. So, detson has been around since 1952. Number two oil furnace manufacturer in North America. We were owned by Carrier between 1998 and 2010. And when we were acquired by our current ownership, the Willette Group, that's when that allowed us to go back into gas. So that's when we started engaging industry. So all of the utilities across North America belong to an organization called Energy Solutions Center. I uh, worked with guys like uh, Building Knowledge, worked with universities, um, Gas Technology Institute, the Canadian Gas Association. So anyone um, in the industry we engaged to try and understand what the problems were. And then included in that list were contractors, distribution, we use Emco and Noble. So really engaging industry to understand what the problems were. So that's where that first list kind of came from to give us that <coughs> framework. <coughs> so backing up to 2008, 2009, when Energy Star for New Home Builders were calling me saying, we've got a problem, we're building houses better than we ever have before, why are we getting more and more comfort complaints? We're constantly in, that, in those houses because the homeowners aren't comfortable. So, we're building houses better, what is the problem? So in labs, we were able to identify what the, problem, um, what the problems were. So we have overshooting and short cycling primarily because of a result of oversizing equipment. So in our lab tests, high performance home, <coughs> it took 14 minutes to hit the delta T between conditioning the space between the main plenum of the furnace to the last room in the house. So when we're short cycling 10, 12 minutes, that's why that last room in the house is not getting treated properly. So now we add that, that diversification of portfolios, right? So we've got large custom homes, you've got those custom homes with all of that beautiful glass that everyone wants, right? And then you've got stacked townhouses, so now you've got the stack effect, so you've got that basement calling for heat and you've got that top floor <laughs> calling for air conditioning. <clears throat> so. Overshooting and short cycling really is the fundamental cause of a lot of what's going on because you couldn't get equipment small enough. That's a test, remember 14 minutes, two seconds, or seven seconds, or whatever. So what we had to address, so this is part of that builder checklist. So right-sized equipment for what we're getting with the envelope. So you guys have all become familiar with F280, so finally now, what builders are doing with their windows and their envelope, um, their insulation values, HRVs, finally you're getting credit to be able to take those, those values and put them into the energy modeling right, to get right size numbers. <coughs> um, so we addressed that with uh, launching <coughs> equipment starting at, our first <laughs> launch was 15,000 BTU and 30,000 BTU modulating. Then the contractors and distribution said, if you guys don't pick up the full line or create a full line, we're not, we're not gonna pick you up. So then we had to go back and go one stage, two stage direct and variable, then the full line. So we, now we've, we go up all the way to 120,000 BTU, but really we came into the market with 15 and 30. Okay, let's go. Um, so now we've got that full line. And then for cooling, we had to do same thing, modulating, and I'll walk you through um, how the modulating works. So three quarters of a ton, up to three tons of cooling 
<clears throat> but the whole concept is low CFM over longer periods of time. That's, that's the formula. Low CFM, longer cycles. Smaller mechanical footprints, so we launched um, cabinet sizes 20% smaller than anything else on the market. And we needed to help find builders money to offset the cost of going to modulation. So that's where we looked at distribution. And, uh, and with us, I, I guess we've really adopted, because of our engagement with the industry, um, better, faster, more cost efficient. And, and when you're on the path of, of continual <coughs> improvement, no matter what industry you're in, better, faster, cost efficient, that's what we all want, right? Make more money faster um, and just do it better. And then, easy for a homeowner, so set it and forget it. Um, so every building scientist now is all, everyone's saying the same thing. And it's funny because <clears throat> working in energy efficiency for so long, we've all had that mentality, and because of existing housing too, right? To, uh, to set back the thermostat so you're not wasting energy during peak hours, and crank the, the system back on at night, get the house to comfort, and then when you're not at home, set the thermostat back again. So now with modulation, we're able to go back to the homeowners and say, you don't have to access your, your system through your, your cell phone. You literally, we want you to set it and forget it. And from a new construction standpoint, better, faster, more cost efficient, if we're keeping those houses at balance, we're decreasing the callbacks. So when you keep a house at balance, and I'll show you the, the facts, keeping the house at balance uh, balances out the relative humidity. Relative humidity is the problem when you get to nail pops, wood warping, etc. So HVAC really plays a huge role, not only in the comfort, but also in actual physical warranty issues in the house as well. And then, we need to come up with a system that's energy flexible. So as municipalities are saying, uh, we don't want gas in 2030, or we don't want carbon in 2030, um, there's conversations like that. Um, with passive house, net zero homes, people are putting solar panels on, they want off the grid. So we need to make sure that, that there's flexibility between gas and electricity, etc. We're all electric systems, so we really had to address the flexibility for energy as well. So first we came up with the right size system for heating and cooling. <clears throat> and uh, I'll walk you through a couple of um, houses that we installed in. So Doug Terry Homes in southwestern Ontario, 2,400 square feet, high performance house. It's Energy Star Next Generation, um, and this was a couple of years ago. So 28,000 BTU furnace, or 28,000 um, load, we put in a 30,000 BTU furnace. The cooling load, 21, just over 21,000, so we put in a two ton. And, uh, and then we have an, a lab house in Ibicus, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 2,600 square foot house. It is a house on roids, that's how I like to describe it in layman's terms, it's on, it's on a crack. Um, and uh, it, its load was 18,500, and because it's a lab house, we were able to put it in the 15,000 BTU furnace, then they had a colder than design winter. And, the, and our um, data out of that house is really awesome to share. So Doug Terry Homes, um, everything's been calculated to the new F280 standard. Um, the house is really tight and high performance. I think its air tightness is like 0.8 or something like that. So um, as a production builder, a small production builder, he, he is leading the way there on, on his numbers. So zero to <coughs> minus five. So the red line's uh, the outdoor temperature, <coughs> the green line is uh, just us monitoring the wind to see if it would activate the P-switch. And then the blue line is the modulation. So what you'll see here is, with the right size system, so the load at 28,000, just over, we put in the 30. And so you'll see the equipment is modulating between 40 and 60% of its capacity. It doesn't go over 60%. So that also shows, even in F280, we still have a lot of fudge factor in there if the equipment's only running at 40 to 60% of its capacity on average. <clears throat> so the sun comes up during the day, house is at temperature, it's a high performance house, system turns off. And then when it's needed, it ramps back up again and runs 40 to 60% of its capacity. Got colder, 
down to minus 20. So now you can see instead of it turning off, it just ramped down to like low speed, 40%. And then when it needed to, it just ramped back up again, but it doesn't exceed 60% of its capacity. And you guys can ask any questions during if this doesn't make sense. And the Ibicus lab um, uh, kind of ran the same thing. We saw that, that same equation. So remember this time, below um, season temperature, um, plus we had an undersized furnace. And so you see the pink line, it hit its capacity for about eight hours over that whole week. Um, and then the rest of the time it just modulated and, and did what it did. So our system is true modulating if it needs 11,412, that's what, that's what it's gonna deliver, it's, it's true modulation. And uh, what we like to see in everything is a nice, consistent, balanced temperature. So that gray line at the top is nice and balanced over the week. And the modulation just does what it needs to do. And that's what it looks like from another angle. So we knew the, um, the formula worked. So low CFM, longer periods of time, longer cycles. So we did the same with cooling. To do that, we had to choose a inverted technology, air source heat pump, Greedy from China. They put hundreds of thousands of these things in a year. So we hung our hat on this technology. These things run, same with the furnace, running under 50 decibels, which is also really important on the cooling side um, because now we've got municipalities saying for spatial separation, you can't put any mechanicals in that spatial separation. We've also got lawnmowers um, and, and other issues with spatial separation with traditional air conditioners. So this addresses a few different things from a spatial separation standpoint on noise and, uh, and space. And we're getting that modulating equipment again. So we're able to run cooling at low CFM longer cycles. Uh, interestingly enough, Doug at that point was putting regular air conditioners in and he was spending about $500 per house putting a dehumidifier in his houses as well. So when he's transitioned now over to the air source heat pump, um, and I'll, sh I'll show you that we've interlocked everything in at 200 CFM. So now in the summer, he's got, um, because that air is crossing the A-coil slowly, he's getting dehumidification at the same time. Um, so he's been able to take those dehumidifiers out of his house. You guys don't have the same humidity issues as he does in southwestern Ontario. So uh, it's a heat pump. <laughs> You've got those nice high COPs in there. Our algorithms are set so if that heat pump's running on, um, on primary heat, all our algorithms will switch over at minus 15, but the COP at minus 15 is still like 1.67 or something on, on I think the um, two ton unit. So they're pretty efficient. And so same thing, even in, uh, same thing we'll see in heating and cooling. So you've got heat set point, cooling set point, CFM, nothing's running over 300 CFM. The Chinook, the furnaces will run no higher than 350, but generally we see 300 CFM. No higher than 60% of its capacity, so you can see it running um, no higher than that. Outdoor temperature, blue lines all over the place. And then what we want to see is 12 days, nice, consistent indoor temperature throughout that time. So that's, what, that's primarily what we see, 40 to 60% of its capacity, nice and balanced no matter, no matter how long it's running for. So then Doug said, hey guys, I have an HRV, can we interlock in? We said, okay. So uh, now we interlock in. So now instead of the system turning off when the house is at temperature, You'll see it doesn't matter what, what the system's calling for, heating or cooling or just um, straight exchange. Um, you've got continuous airflow there. So uh, when the engineers, we were also monitoring relative humidity. So when the engineers saw this, they're like, uh-oh, that's not what we designed. So you can see on the left, top left there. So uh, relative humidity is in orange, blue is uh, the temperature. And so we don't want to see that variance between those two. Temperature isn't the problem when it's in new construction or any house really, it's the relative humidity. So when we get a nice continuous airflow, that's when we, we see that correlation to balance. So our engineers looked at that, had a little panic, and then we figured, hey, maybe he's got a setback on the thermostat. 
So then we called, got the thermostat set back, taken off, and now you can see much better balance. The basement, 8% difference overnight. So <laughs> really fundamentally helps um, for us tell builders, you literally, you've got the sales pitch here to your homeowners. Set it and forget it. It's easy for you. Your life's so complicated. You don't need to <laughs> access anything. But from a new construction standpoint, don't touch it. Let that house get to balance so we can decrease those callbacks. Um, so it's a little bit of a change in mentality for people that have come from inefficient houses or, or where they've been playing with um, energy pricing. So it's a little bit of a change, but, but this is what we, we need to move to. So um, four stairs, systems all around, getting low BTU furnaces, addressing modulation or introducing modulation at low CFM, longer cycles, reducing noise inside and out, driving thermal balance. We want that house to be nice and comfortable all the time and driving better comfort. So then, utilities said, okay, so now we've got diversification into even smaller units, multi-res construction, um, and we're absolutely out of the market when it comes to gas, right? So you guys that, that rep um, heat pumps and combi systems, everything else, gas is, is really taking a hit when it comes to smaller um, even smaller units because you can't get equipment small enough. So gas, forced air gas systems is completely out of the equation. So they asked us to go smaller and we did. Um, I don't, have you guys seen any of these? Cam, you've seen them? So this is, this unit 62 pounds fully loaded. I travel with it, it comes on the turnstile with my suitcase. Um, customs don't like me very much. I get pulled into the secondary room and then I usually talk myself out of the third room by telling them it's not a furnace, it's a, it's a, a pretty floor model of a pretend furnace. So um, these things were built for one story construction, maybe up to 1,500 square feet. Um, you can put them in, there. everything we do is multi-positional as well, so now we're able to give builders the option of maybe wall bracket mounting them above the stacked washer and dryer. Um, Contractor, you guys don't like that combination. is a little harder What's to get into. What's the size? What's the size of that? Um, it's 20. Of course, you're gonna ask me that. I'll have to look on the brochure. I'll get you the dimensions. It's it's small. Yeah, how many so these ones are 15,000. So we have a regular 15,000 that, and everything modulates to 40% on the gas side. So um, the 15 modulates down to six. With this guy, it throws a little less CFM, so that's why generally we're one-story construction. In Portland, Oregon, where um, Habitat for Humanity has these in two-story townhouses. Um, out here, two-story townhouses. Um, in Ontario, we wouldn't get away with that, right? You need a little more push. So these guys have throw a little less, but 15,000 down to six. So then we had to look at air distribution. So think about those complaints that we get from our traditional system. So not only do we have that short cycling overshooting, right, like that barrel on and everything starts knocking and banging, right? So we've got sheet metal, all that sheet metal work, heating up, cooling off. Then you've got 90 degree corners, turbulence, right? So you've got a full shoot, hits the turbulence and then starts causing chaos. So, so we wanted to look at fundamentally where those, um, complaints were coming from, from a design standpoint, and how we could introduce them. And then let's talk that financial equation. How do we get you guys installing better and faster so you can do more installs a week and, and increase your top line and help builders with their margins as well um, to help move everyone over to modulation. So we really needed to address um, the fundamentals of distribution. So, um, we also, to be able to maximize or optimize the mechanical footprint, looking at bulkheads, remember that, that all important square footage is more and more of a premium. So can we get rid of bulkheads? Can we decrease the number of um, returns? Can we look at all of that usable floor space that homeowners like, I wanna move my bed here, oh, I can't, I'm gonna cover that beautiful register on the floor. So can we move those registers around as well? And, um, and then on the contractor side, more importantly, think about 
Anyone can use modulation, get, get the traditional ducts down at 10% leakage. Guys, how much extra time is that to get from what you're doing now to cons consistent 10% leakage? Extra couple of hours? So that's your time. So how can we help you speed up that installation time to get consistent under 10% leakage? All right, so we bring everything into the interior walls of the house six inch or eight inch mains and uh, we put everything six inches from the ceiling and we let science take over um, so with this system so we launched two and a half inch flex uh, between seven and 25 feet runs from the main so you, we've got two different colors I'm going to pass this around so gasketed connections um, for air sealing for a six inch or eight inch main and uh, you've got construction caps all the way through to keep debris out um, and then when everything's painted and ready to go you can put the diffusers on and, um, and I'll talk about the building science from that so you can pass this around and then this little thing is a restrictor cap as well <coughs> so with the traditional system we've tested this velvet testing everything else so traditional system you get three feet of throw with our system, we get nine feet of throw. So it's like sticking your thumb over that garden hose, right, when the water's running. So we, we wanna stick our thumb in there, so decrease the volume of area, get better throw, so we get that, that three feet versus nine feet. But then it's also that fine line between turning into a high velocity system that builders said we don't want high velocity systems. So we knew we needed to design a system to keep the static pressure so the average static pressure for a high V system is 1.2. Our static pressure is average of 0.68, so low to medium velocity, paired with equipment, modulating, running at low CFM, longer cycles. So uh, the diffusers are six inches from the ceiling. We're getting nine feet of throw. The air sticks to the ceiling as long as it can. It's called the Kwanda effect. So it will stick to the ceiling as long as it can. So three feet of throw versus nine feet of throw. So much better mix and distribution. And uh, we've been tested, a certified energy evaluator has tested at 16 feet away. We've got the same CFM coming out of the diffuser plate on the wall and the same CFM 16 feet of width. 16 <coughs> feet away. Someone told me last week they got tested at 19 feet. It's the same. So everything's in the interior walls off of those rounds and nice fast installs. We um, So they're two and a half inch. The smallest holes I would say is two and five eighths, but really these guys can just pop holes in the floor and, and feed them through. Any feedback on anyone that's installed it so far for group? Two and three quarters. Two and three quarters. Perfect. <coughs> And so you can see here construction caps all the way through. So keeping those lines nice and clean all the way through construction. And, uh, and so we do pair heads together. Um, and, uh, and that just gives it even more push. So with that nine feet of throw, pairing them together, it, it gets even more oomph behind it. And uh, we are designing these to the heat loss and heat gain based on F280 calcs including room by room. So we take the room by room and design each house for what it needs. And it's really zoned ready because we're designing per floor, essentially to, to deliver. So it's a, it's a very cool system. I'll show you a couple of designs. Builders have um, come up with, they're painting the diffuser heads, they're painting inside the 90 degree collars to get a uniform color in the walls. Um, but it's, People are getting used to it, I guess. Some people complain about it, but once once they get used to it and they understand the benefits of having the system, the homeowners have been pretty comfortable with it. And uh, so what we do is, to, again, take those room-by-room room calculations um, and then help with us. We're helping train HVAC designers, contractors, distribution to help do that duct design. We have some builders doing their own d duct design, um, engineering firms doing the duct design, and um, so identifying where to put the main, so centrally located in the house, so we can maximize that 25 feet of run um, to, to um, 
get that house balanced. So the dotted lines, for example, would be those uh, mains are in the floor, and then the solid, those mains are in the ceiling. Uh, returns. So the system is so efficient that we know that you can essentially use one return per floor and just undercut the door by an eighth of an inch um, per diffuser head. Some builders still want to use traditional um, returns, one per room, but this is the opportunity to be able to kind of take a step back and say, all right, we're using a more efficient system. If we effectively put the um, low wall return and high wall return in the right place, centrally located, we should, we should be able to switch over. Often, um, builders, first time they are using the system, we have to, it's the smartest way is to engage the municipality before they have to go inspect the first time they're seeing these things, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, so there's opportunities there to, again, get rid of some expensive returns and sheet metal work it, as well. So the fundamentals of the low to medium velocity um, system. So the right static pressure be, uh, mixed with that better throw, the nine feet of, of throw, with that better mixing that we've seen, improve the air leakage. So these things screw together two to five percent leakage. Um, so that's a lot of um, time saved on getting that system sealed. And then again, optimizing the floor designs and mechanical designs. So um, we've got um, Doug Terry Holmes now, he's doing his own duct design and his houses are pretty sweet now. I was just in one of his new bungalow designs. I did have pictures, but I lost them in computer number one. Now I'm on three, so my, they're gone. Um, I'll have to go back. So uh, you go down the stairs into his bungalow and you turn the corner and he's got the furnace tucked in there, the HRV on the other side, drain water heat recovery between the furnace and the stairs, low wall return under the stairs. Now he's got all of that amazing, beautiful, sellable basement space that he's never had before because we know what basements usually end up looking like is is try and build the usable space around our mechanical. So he's been able to really start um, fundamentally finding his homeowners a lot more usable space. Yes? Uh, I noticed in that picture you had uh, like three outlets lined up yes. there, or actually on the other side of the door. Yep. So five there. Is that the way, so in a room like this, would you have sort of five on one wall, or would you try to get two here, two there, sort of thing? It totally, it absolutely depends, and that's where the training kind of comes in with our installation guides. Sometimes, honestly, you might have a room um, that only needs two, but it's all dictated by one, what equipment we're putting in, because if the equipment throws um, more CFM and you don't have a lot of rooms, then we have to find somewhere to distribute that air, because we design at about an average of 33 CFM per diffuser, because we want to keep everything at that right low to medium velocity, right? So, <clears throat> um, we sometimes we, we end up in a house that they don't want to change the envelope, right? And so other builders, all our, our team is really good at saying, hey, you're really close to getting down to another size furnace. So instead of a 45, make a slight change to your envelope or HRV or your windows. Let's find that extra BTU get down to a smaller furnace and the potential is there that we could go into less duct runs because it's a smaller um, CFM. Um, so, and often cooling dictates that as, <laughs> as well. We design everything to cooling. Um, we design everything to the highest CFM uh, potential and um, yeah, so sometimes you do end up with multiple rooms. Sometimes you end up with those great rooms and zero walls, right? So even in an unfinished basement, it's unfinished. We don't have any walls to get down into. So then we'll get into downflow positioning. So in a basement, if you're not finishing the basement, we're not going to put the diffuser heads in the middle of the basement just in case they put furniture there. So we're going to get them to as close to the exterior walls as possible. Um, downflow and then as a homeowner decides to finish the walls, then they'll be able to take that extra feed and get it down in eventually. So we, we play. And uh, we teach people how to, to play with positioning and etc. But yeah, you wouldn't want uh, you wouldn't want um, 
a ret high wall return and a diffuser is just going s right. right. Like we'll avoid situations like that as much as possible. And the six inches actually came from builders saying, what if the homeowner puts crown molding in after? Right? So, so we've seen Habitat for Humanity in Oregon, they've got them like snug to the ceiling, but um, for the most part, we just six inches from the ceiling, it leaves a lot of room for play for the homeowner after. So energy flexibility, so <coughs> gas furnace, heat pump for cooling, that, that's simple. Um, then you've got the option to go heat pump for heating and cooling with gas backup. Then you've got the other option to, um, and everything has propane conversion kit, um, as well for the gas furnace. Then the all electric solution, you've got the heat pump for heating and cooling, and then instead of a backup, we it's shared load. So as soon as that performance, that heat pump just can't get there, it needs help, we'll, it will kick in with the all electric modulating furnace as well um, that we have. So that, that line's called the Supreme, and, and uh, we have a compact version coming out of that. Um, for the all electric as well, because builders said, "Hey, can we have all electric uh, little smaller units too?" So, so we're um, re really responding to what the industry is saying that they need. And then now we've got. So I would say, yeah. Can you have, uh, the, is the small package? Yes, as long as it's as long as you go modulating, you can use the smart ducts. You don't want to get into a situation where you are putting a traditional two-stage furnace on there because then you're going to have a high velocity system and um, I think high velocity systems aren't bad they just have a really bad reputation and it's more so because the inconsistency in in installation right and uh, and it's it's just gotten a bad rap and it's and it's the bad wraps from dra cracked drywall to pays flying off heads and curtains flying off windows right or walls so um, some builders do high velocity really well and other ones just can't get it right. So uh, fundamentally the builder said we don't want high velocity systems anymore and the noise probably is like the biggest thing, I would say. So um, through industry engagement with Natural Resources Canada and builders, a very large, pretty much Canada's largest production builder said we have a fundamental problem, period, we need to go to zoning. So on a production standpoint, that's thousands of dollars extra per house. So they engaged with us to design a zoning system. And uh, so now we've come up with a four zone, two stage damper system, it's really cool. Um, and, and that just, I say, modulation has solved 96, 98% of the problems out there that we've fundamentally been having um, out of the design. But zoning allows us to get even better now. And I, when I first started with this system, I was like, what's the big deal? Like, we fixed it with modulation. Like, can't we just leave it alone already? Like, why are these builders going to overkill it? And then I started thinking about, um, look at the diversification of our families and, and the uses of our houses, right? So you've got home offices. You've got in-law suites. You've got... Um, different situations you've got those problem areas that we just won't solve with envelope because we want those fancy windows and that that full south facing wall so sometimes there are those situations where you guys that are doing the design there's nothing we can do about it so zoning actually allows us to really take a fundamental um, next step at at driving the comfort even further so Doug Terry Holmes his salespeople I've known them for 10 years, so they have no problem calling and freaking out on me. So I get the phone call one day, Michelle, you lied. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And they said, uh, you said our houses were going to be comfortable all the time. Okay. She goes, it is minus 10 outside and it's 27 degrees in the house. We're cooking. We want the air conditioner on. Why are, why are we cooking? And I said, well, uh, have you told Doug, you're, you're the owner? Have you told him? No, uh, you need to fix this. And I said, well, one, it's minus 10. You don't want the air conditioning on. And two, you need to call Doug. 
So their south-facing window, um, they had made a fundamental decision not to put a triple in to see if he would cook his salespeople out, and he totally did. Um, but that's where zoning would really come in handy because they knew there was a problem area or problem wall, and they and they could have fixed that with with zoning. So our zoning system, just to walk through it really quick, two stage dampers. So instead of two zones fighting each other, so that top floor in the house in a townhouse calling for high cooling um, in the summer and the basement calling for high heat, instead of those two zones fighting each other, those two zones are going to open up and share amongst themselves. So you're, you're really optimizing the energy that's already in the house and the, those zones are just going to share amongst themselves. So it's a very cool system. Um, so the capacity, we maxed out at 60,000 BTU um, for that system and three tons of cooling. And again, so we're, with that modulation and the smart ducts, we're really able to play. Um, and with that system, you can still stay traditional ducts, actually. Uh, traditional round. How many outlets would you have on the, on the bigger system? <coughs> on the biggest system? Yeah, yeah. Um, with the, for the zoning? Yeah, like a three ton cooling. It, to it totally depends, right? Like we would, those guys would, um, you could probably, you would be able to see it once you designed a system and get into the Excel spreadsheet. I wouldn't know that off the top of my head, but I'm sure we, you and I could take a spreadsheet at the end and plop in all of the maxes and find out how many duck runs that would be. Does anyone have any questions while I'm on this? Yes. Just on the zone, if I understood you correctly, basically you're just trying to balance out two zones. We have two extremes. So we have, well, yeah, so we have up to four zone capability, right, on the, that distribution box. And it's really about driving comfort. So instead of with our regular modulating system, we've got one thermostat. Now with the zoning system, you put a two stage thermostat in each zone and, and balance the, the zones and all the algorithms and protocols, as long as there's a two-stage call, the system will will kick in and, and open up amongst themselves and do their thing. Just the yep, okay. exactly. Yep. Uh, so right now we've got about 10 prototypes um, installed and, uh, and uh, we've got one builder that's they're doing full monitoring with Canadian Gas Association and, and Natural Resources Canada. So we're just going to sit tight and watch all of that happen through a full heating season and cooling season, and then we'll probably launch our zoning system in a year. But uh, we really want to. We know that we've got a formula there that that is really working so far, and um, Bob Deeks has got one of our prototypes as well. So um, that'll be cool to have it in different climate regions as well. So does that fan does the furnace modulate the the fan? So. Um, yeah, so it will, it will, the algorithms kind of take over on what, what the call is on those thermostats, right? So for the modulation, we modulated the gas compressor and the fan, like so everything modulates and then the protocols will take, take over on the, on the zones in a very technical way to describe it. Just, I talk in layman's terms. So. So that's kind of what it looks like with the distribution box and, and those uh, papers. And it's all about static pressure. We want to keep everything the right static pressure all the way through <coughs> so the zones don't fight each other. And, uh, and then, so remember, when we do our smart duct design, it's basically zone ready because we're designing per floor. So um, it's sometimes even a structural beam will be zoned by floor and zone naturally with the smart duct system. So this takes it even step further with zoning um, to drive comfort um, <coughs> through specific zones. So remember, if you remember anything from tonight and me talking your ears off, builder, building better, faster, and more cost efficient. That's the underlying um, message and, and we're just to an engaged and passionate group of people that are trying to fix the industry and we're leading the way right now and um, so we're doing what we can to support um, the industry out there and and uh, 
but fundamentally driving comfort and balance, something easy to use and operate, um, better equipment, faster and easier to install to help improve everyone's bottom line, decreasing callbacks and warranties, and and more more importantly, I think from especially from any production standpoint, like a custom builder, it's easy for you guys to like be on top of everything and watch every detail. But when you've got multiple projects going on and multiple crews, it, it gets complicated to to do it consistently, crew by crew consistently, and and that's what we need um, to help move the industry forward as everyone's pushing to that net zero goal in 2030. We're going there, we all got to get there, and uh, we know that this is the way um, to do it with keeping that traditional gas forced air um, system option. So we're here to support, so I work again with builders, utilities, um, duct designers, certified energy evaluators, um, my colleague Jonathan, um, he manages our distribution and contractor relationships and um, if you guys have any questions or you have examples or a project that you want to talk about, reach me, we'll, we'll figure it out. We've got lots of examples all over Canada and the U.S. of installs and projects that we've been doing. Um, Northwest Natural, really close to here in Portland, Oregon, they just put in um, seven systems into a Habitat for Humanity um, project, so we've, they did a really cool video and called us after and said, hey, you guys need to see your Detson video that we did, and we're like, okay, thanks for letting us know. But um, very cool project for Habitat for Humanity, and, and uh, so the West Coast kind of taking off a little bit just because they're naturally low load, right? Um, homes and they don't really do a lot of cooling and then I've got guys in New Mexico saying we just we want a modulating air handler we don't just cut off the electric resistant coils just give us the smart ducts give us the heat pump and leave us alone we don't want anything else <laughs> so every region's a little different and, and what we're doing and we've got some cool projects so. are you guys doing that? sorry? are you making a cooling only smart duct? Uh, so we're gonna have um, uh, we've Probably sometime next year we're going to launch so the Supreme Compact version. Um, so you can do that now with the Supreme Compact version. That's the we have an air handler. It's a two-stage air handler. We're not going to do anything with that. It's called the DCH, and that's more for wet heat, like the guys that are doing wet heat. Um, so the Supreme, the regular electric furnace, we're going to bump that down to a compact version and have a zero kilowatt option, five kilowatt option, and a ten kilowatt option. So, yes? Um, this is like, what temperature rise are your gas furnaces going to be running at? Oh my gosh, that's, that's okay. so I'll technical. Don't worry about it. Um, I do have those numbers on my brochure. No one ever asked me that, ever. I'm also <coughs> curious another question. Yes. It looked like you had 450 CFM and you're stuffing three tons into it. Did I misread that? Uh, for the zoning? No, it's 400 CFM, which I was going to rise to 6500. Thanks, Noah. It's 8 inch pipe and 420. It's 8 inch pipe for Hanlo, 420. Yeah, and 6 inch will be 200. 250 for 6 inch. Okay. Um, one of the things that also puzzled me, this has been a hell of a little recently about F280. Yeah. And yet here you've done a heat loss to show 30,000, you stuff 30 into it, and you're running 60%. Yeah. Is that program, and it's been totally perfect, is that bad a misestimate of the loss? Yes, it is. We're, we are an industry full of fudge factors, right? We, we want to be protected. We, we don't, we don't want to be riding the edge. I'm a sailor and you ride that edge and it can go very wrong very quickly. So I think we fundamentally as an industry have a lot of fudge factors built into the numbers. And, and F280, don't get me wrong, F280, we are getting a lot better because finally, and that's where the fundamental problems have come from, is in high performance homes, the builders were not getting credit for the added insulation, the better windows, and the air tightness, right? We, fundamentally, we weren't in the energy modeling. Who does energy modeling here? Well, we all do. We're heat loss in houses to put furnaces in. But so we weren't getting those right numbers, or we're, we're making a general statement and a rule of thumb. 
this many square feet, this many tons. And as an association, we spend a fair bit of money to ensure that everything that we do in our standard quality first cluster guidelines is compliant. But it sure as hell it looks like it's a misguided effort with the errors you're just pointing out. Is that Say that again. No. Yeah. No, so the Doug Terry's house is a like that's a regular his regular production houses. He's putting yeah, in a thirty. I I think F two eighty is just the standard to which you're still. You're taking those standards on how to recognize those extra things and plop it in. It's not. It's not the fix. Fix. Sure. Sure. It's a, like you. But what we're consistently seeing in a high performance house with the Energy Star qualified homes, the R2000 houses, the net zero houses that we're doing, there's still a lot of room. Those houses are still even even right sized, right? So the calcs are coming in at, at, at 24,000. We're putting in a 30 and they're still running at 40 to 60% of their capacity. The only time that you'll see them bump is if it's like a day where they're they're, they're having a party and the window, <laughs> windows are open, right? The system's trying to balance the house out. Like, we're still seeing those numbers cons consistently coming in at in the modulating 40 to 60%. It's a solid number. Your monitoring would tend to be quite credible, and if you're getting consistently 60% running on something that's theoretically perfectly sized, it doesn't leave doubts in our standard methodology of and, and honestly, the calcs, and I'm not crapping on F280 because it's the, it's, we're making very good headway. And, and think about it, we as an industry in the new construction industry have been, it's been all envelope centric. And now finally we're taking a step back and saying, okay, we got to, we have to address mechanicals is the last thing that has to change. Um, but uh, if you, even with LEAP, like you guys in Vancouver, builders, contractors um, went through LEAP. I think Rob Pope ran the numbers, uh, Ryan ran numbers, Building Knowledge in Ontario ran numbers, and someone else ran those numbers all in the same house, and they all had four different numbers. Like it's, it's consistent, right? Everyone, you're, you're never going to have the, <laughs> the same numbers, but, but from us, from a manufacturing standpoint, I say to a builder or a contractor, get me your room by room, right? And we'll, we'll help you design the system according to the room by room. At the end of the day, it's not our stamp. It's the, it's the engineer's stamp. It's the HVAC designer's, the contractor's stamp. We're going to help get that system to deliver <laughs> um, based on whoever's stamp is on it and what numbers they're giving us. We're, we're not going to override that. If I see, if we see, um, like a, through LEAP, I just had a house, it was 600 BTU off, putting a 30,000 BTU furnace in, right? So we have to put in a 45. We'll always call the builder and say, is there any chance? It's 600 BTU. And we, we know 40, 60% capacity, there's a lot of fudge factor in there, it's totally fine. But no inspector is going to come in and say, hold on a second, your number here says you need a 45, why is there a 30? It's, it's not going to pass. So we'll push back when we can. But at the end of the day, too, any contractor, like you guys know this, the, the, here's the number, I'm specking it. I'm not gonna, you're not, no one's going to take a step back and say, hold on a second, I'm not going to give you that 45 BT thousand BT furnace. No one's going to do that. No one has time to do that. So that's why for me there is a little bit of a challenge. I have to engage builders and engage everyone else on their team and say hey there's an opportunity here but it, it takes time. Welcome to my world. So could you just please go back a few slides where you had that 60,000 BTU and, and uh, three ton unit, three ton cooling. It, it, it sits in something about 430 CFM. 
Yep. And now I'm confused from the discussion. If that's total CFM, and if so, can we get that through? Uh, well, obviously, you can get it through the, the, the eight inch duct. But if it's not total CFM, what's the temperature rise going to be? And it was at 25 percent. Yeah. So, so. It was modulated down. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the fundamentally, it's it's taking it's kind of taking a step backwards every time, right? Say. Okay, we're going to pick the equipment, then we have to look at what each room needs, then figure out what, what you need, and then with the zoning system now, we know 8 inch, 430 CFM per zone, um, so okay. so we need that 60,000 BT furnace. We're not going to put in a 75 because we need we need those CFM to be the right CFM. Yeah, so. it makes sense now. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Just a, one last question. Yes. question. Uh, when it is zoning, when you're shutting zones down, uh, does the modulation of the fan happen based on the static pressure, or is it just the nature of percentage of zones open? Uh, I think it's a combination of everything. So, so the fundamental design, right, to keep that static pressure correct. Um, so that's in the in the design off of those mains. So we're not we're keeping that 430 true for for the eight inch. Um, and then, and then the system itself modulates at the gas, at the compressor side and the fan side. So, and then the two-stage damper or the two-stage thermostats, right? That's controlling. Um, then there's protocols amongst sure, all of those algorithms. Sharing of the air. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Great. So, yes. Yeah, the fans climate is uh, Emerson climate has to keep the heat. So the so the, um, everyone contractors just size the returns as conventionally. Yep. <coughs> thermostat so we had if we had launched a new system and a new thermostat um, Emco would have killed us the contractors would have killed us so um, so we hung our hat on white Rogers um, just to handle the algorithms for all of the the modulating equipment so um, it's not Wi-Fi capable and stuff like that but it it has allowed us to do everything that we need to do to get the systems talking to each other and get that modulation so <coughs> So solving one problem at a time, one problem at a time. So equipment first. We'll figure out the Wi-Fi later. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much. Also, want to thank once again our tabletop exhib exhibitors. Uh, Bill, I guess we're going to have you up here one of these days. <laughs> by the looks of it now. <laughs> Uh, and thanks again to Kim for presenting the booklet. Everybody make sure you grab a copy of it and uh, give her your comments. And thanks for coming out.